call to order the meeting of the mayor and board of aldermen for Tuesday, October the 19th. First thing on our agenda is to um, adopt the agenda for the meeting. I've got a few changes for you. Um, if you will, please delete numbers 14 and 28. Both of those items are being tabled and we will take them up at a future meeting. Delete number 14 and 28. And also, if you would, add to the consent agenda under B, number seven, to accept a resignation at the Oxford Conference Center. And under C, Number two, request permission to accept donations in the amount of $725 to the Animal Resource Center. So two additions to the consent agenda, two deletions. Is there anything else, Ashley? No, ma'am, I didn't have anything. All right, any other department head have a change? All right, then with those changes, I would ask for a motion to adopt the agenda for the meeting. So moved. Second. All in favor? Uh, Any opposed? Well, we will start with the mayor's report, um, and we're going to start with some good news for once. We have five people in the hospital with COVID. One of those five is in ICU. Um, this time last month, I believe we had 56 in the hospital with COVID. So um, things are progressing very well. You will see that we will start to only report the number of hospitalizations as we do our daily report although the number of positive cases will still be tracked on our city website. What we're finding is that uh, many people are um, doing home tests um, or are not testing. The Department of Health is being very sporadic and when they enter information and report it, so one day you have five, the next day you have 74. It, it's just, um, we don't believe that that is giving us any real useful information anymore. We are going to continue to report hospital numbers and so you can see those on our city um, social media. Another piece of good news, I am thrilled to report that our tax revenues representing taxes collected in the month of August. Our sales tax came in at $1,047,603.80. And that is up 10% from last month. It's up 17% for the same month last year. And it's also up from 2019, which is really what I use as the measuring stick. Um, for those of you, the students that are in the audience tonight, when we get our sales tax revenues, in, they are taxes collected two months prior. Okay, so the taxes that we received in October were actually collected in the month of August. So um, our 2% food and beverage tax came in at $333,402.23. That's up 15% from the same month last year and up 20% from the same month last year, uh, year before. Hotel Motel Tax um, gets the most improved award, coming in at $447,312.99, and that's up 34% from last month, and it's up 39% from August of last year. So all three taxes are up from the same months in 2019 as well, and this is only the third time in the history of us collecting sales tax that sales taxes come in over a million dollars. So things are going really well and Oxford's economy is rocking and rolling. Um, you may have seen the joint statement released last week on behalf of myself and this board and the Lafayette County Board of Supervisors, Senator Nicole Boyd and Representative Clay DeWeese. This was a joint statement um, for an immediate plan for Highway 7 safety improvements in Lafayette County. The statement read, for more than 20 years, City of Oxford and Lafayette County leaders have implored the Mississippi Department of Transportation and State of Mississippi elected leaders to address safety improvements on Highway 7. It's long past time that this be a top priority for our state. We are requesting your immediate attention and allocation of appropriate project funding to improve the stretch of Mississippi Highway 7 that spans from the intersection of Highway 7 and Highway 6 through the Highway 7-9 split to the southernmost Lafayette County boundary. This portion of Highway 7 is used by thousands of our neighbors every day from Marshall, Calhoun, and Yalabusha counties as they travel between Holly Springs, Bruce, Calhoun City, and other locations north and south. More than 24,000 citizens travel this road daily to and from Lafayette County for work and access services. Additional visitors to Oxford and Lafayette County and the University of Mississippi travel this road for special events every weekend. 
Between the morning hours of Tuesday, October 5th, 2021, and the evening of Wednesday, October the 6th, three people lost their lives in two accidents that occurred on this stretch of highway. At what point will there be enough loss to get these dire safety concerns addressed? Since 2014, more than 800 accidents have been recorded on Highway 7 within the Oxford city limits. Understand that between 2014 and 2018, a large portion of this most dangerous section of Highway 7 was not in the city limits. So we, these numbers don't reflect those accidents in areas outside the city limits today. Since December 2015, there have been 16 fatalities on this relatively short stretch of highway. We expect your immediate attention and await your plans for safety improvement. In response to that, I received um, the following from Mississippi Department of Transportation Executive Director Brad White, verifying his receipt of our letter and stating the Mississippi Transportation Commission through the Vision 21 Capacity Projects Program has designated to the legislature SR7 from SR9 to 0.2 miles south of SR6 as an immediate need. As such, the Mississippi Department of Transportation has taken pre-construction steps and completed partial design of this project. Appropriate funding is necessary to move this project forward to completion. Well, it is in every project. Um, Director Brad White, uh, Senator Nicole Boyd, and Representative Clay DeWeese and myself are meeting later this week to talk about some funding options and hopefully talk about MDOT applying for some federal dollars to get this project done. So I'll keep you updated on the progress. It is going to be such a busy week and weekend in Oxford. So those tax numbers are gonna keep going up and we can't wait. The city and university um, will be hosting the staff members of all of Mississippi's federal delegation. We'll have 56 staffers in town beginning Thursday and this gives us such a good opportunity to not only tell them about our community and our successes and challenges, but to actually show them. And this is a great um, weekend every year to build relationships with these staffers. Visit Oxford is gonna kick off this busy weekend on Friday with historic double-decker bus tours, and those will leave from in front of Visit Oxford and will be at three and four. From five to seven on Friday, you can hear tunes around town at Oxford Square North, um, outside the Growler, Spring Street Cigars on South Lamar, and at the North, North Lamar Pocket Park. And at six on Friday, OPC will host the screening of Hocus Pocus at Bailey Branch Park. If that's not enough for you, you could come to the square at 6.30 for Square Jam, which is always a lot of fun. We'll have a full-size basketball court set up out here in front of City Hall. On Saturday from 9 to 11, the SEC Nation will be broadcasting from the Grove. At 11.30, double-decker bus shuttles will be running from City Hall to the Grove. And at 2.30, we will have Ole Miss beating LSU and the retirement ceremony of the Eli Manning jersey. So, um, don't wear yourself out though because at two o'clock on Sunday we got women's soccer at Ole Miss. So, you got a lot to plan for this weekend. Um, and for those who are not big sports fans, there are also movies at the drive-in on Friday and Saturday and you can check out Oxfilm, O-X-F-I-L-M dot com for screening dates and times. And just so you know, those are just the public events that are going on. This past week was nuts too, which we like to see. There were 300 families who were attending the Ole Miss Family Association Fall Family Weekend. Southern Food Alliance had around 250 guests in town with events all over town. M-Trade had over 100 soccer teams in town this past weekend for a tournament. Tailgate for Palmer Home was held last weekend and many other events. Um, every city department is hopping right now trying to keep up with all that is going on. Um, and in closing, I'll say that Halloween is October the 31st. Halloween is always October the 31st. I wish that we'd kept a log of how many people have called us to ask when Halloween was going to be this year because we don't set national holidays. But Halloween's going to be October the 31st as it always is. Apparently um, in... 1998, we played LSU on a Saturday night that was Halloween, and Halloween trick-or-treaters were asked to trick-or-treat the day before because we didn't want anybody to get smushed on North or South Lamar trick-or-treating in a night game LSU traffic, and the same thing in, for an Auburn game in 2015. But public safety would be the only reason that we would move Halloween, and um, neighborhoods and churches and different organizations are obviously welcome to trick-or-treat whenever in the world they want to, whether that's in October or January. 
but um, Halloween is October the 31st and it will not change based on rain or anything else. So there you have it, October the 31st, happy Halloween. Okay, with that all being said, I'm gonna ask this board to authorize the approval of the minutes of the regular meeting on October the 5th. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Any Aye. opposed? Ask you to authorize the approval of accounts for all city departments. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? I ask the board to consider the consent agenda with the additions at C2 and B7. Motion to approve the consent agenda. Second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Um, I'm gonna ask the board to consider a resolution Recognizing October the 29th, 2021 is Arbor Day. Is there anyone here that was going to read that resolution? Okay, I'll do it. Whereas Arbor Day has been recognized nationwide since 1882, this year due to COVID-19, we moved our celebration from the spring to the fall, with both seasons being very good times to plant trees. And whereas it is recognized that the preservation of trees enhances scenic beauty, sustains long-term increases in property values, encourages quality development, enhances the economic vitality of business areas, reduces erosion, reduces heating and cooling costs, moderates the temperature and cleans the air. And whereas the public policy of the city of Oxford favors the preservation of large mature trees, which are vital components of the beauty, charm, and character of the city. And whereas the stewardship of our urban forest not only requires planting of trees, but is importantly the care and preservation of existing trees. And whereas all citizens of the city of Oxford are urged to do their part to protect our urban forest canopy and to take care of our trees in such a way as to preserve and promote their well-being for this and all future generations. So therefore, be it resolved on behalf of the citizens of the city of Oxford this 29th day of October 2021 is hereby recognized and celebrated in Oxford as Arbor Day. Do I have a motion to accept that resolution? Motion made. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? And we thank our tree commission that is so dedicated to preserving the trees in our community. Um, I'll invite Kenny Ferris up now to give us an update from Visit Oxford. Hey, thanks for having me. Um, it's that time of year when I come and give you our action plan, which is pretty much um, just what we're gonna be up to for the next fiscal year. Um, but I wanted to show you a video of what we have been up to. Kinda kill two birds with one stone, so we're ready, Chris. Collaborative, resilient, and tactical. The three words that best describe Visit Oxford this past year. After the onset of COVID-19, Visit Oxford energetically organized dozens of well-attended outdoor events, worked with numerous community partners to strengthen tourism, and engaged in strategic marketing efforts, such as the Visit Oxford Safer campaign to promote safe travel. Doubling down on their outdoor sports tourism partnership with M-Trade Park, Oxford saw an economic impact of $3.8 million in the year 2020. Pandemic-related tourism losses in Oxford were largely mitigated by this organization's ability to continue fostering successful partnerships, execute a multifaceted marketing plan, and to continue growing its engaging social media presence. All right, so that's, that's just um, something that we had created for another um, thing that we were working on in our office. So I wanted to show it to y'all um, as it kind of leads right into our um, action plan. So the executive summary, I'm not going to go through every bit of it, don't worry. Um, but, you know, we I started um, as director in November of 19, and then, of course, six months later, COVID hit. So we just struggled with, um, you know, balancing the health and safety of our citizens, of course, with the economic um, health of businesses in our community. So it just kind of made us flip on a dime a little bit um, to change everything that we're used to doing to get visitors to come in, you know, to kind of being more a community management organization. Um, and thank you all for your help and support through that. It was um, different and hard, um, but we made it. And then last year, um, like the video said, we were able to kind of mitigate a lot of losses um, thanks to our CARES funding. Um, we were able to really put out more advertising than a lot of our um, neighboring states. And so um, Mississippi's travel and tourism really was not down as much as a lot of other states. 
um, in the southeast region. And then, so now for this year, which I'm really excited about because I feel like we get to actually start kind of um, what I had hoped to start um, in 19, um, just kind of focus-driven approach on sales and marketing um, and measuring everything with a strong ROI. Um, going on to page three, not much has changed with our market. I feel like we know our market pretty well. It stayed true through um, that extra advertising that we were able to do last year. So I feel like we're in a good place to know who our traveler is and um, need a couple of normal years before doing another kind of research study to test that. And then on to sales, um, just really quickly, we are going to focus 40% domestic leisure, um, and then we're going to focus about 20% of our time and efforts on meetings and conventions, and only 5% on international, as that's still kind of slow to come back um, due to the pandemic, and then 35% um, for our sports, military, education, retiree, and family, um, as the video stated um, sports really kind of got us through the pandemic and um, we were able to focus a lot of energy on that and realize we had a lot of um, areas that we could improve on how we spent our budget to attract sporting groups. Um, and then going on to page five, just um, really quickly, those event promotions over on the right hand side of the page, those are events that we're promoting through our marketing um, all year long, um, not all just ones that we promote or that we sponsor in our office, but just kind of annual events that we are promoting all year. Um, and then page six, public relations. Um, we'll continue to host media here. Um, we get lots of inquiries and we are vetting them pretty heavily. Um, all of the writers are really hungry to kind of get back to work and um, Oxford is an attractive place for them to come. So we are really um, vetting those to make sure that we are getting the best bang for our buck when we um, have them in town. And then over to page seven um, for marketing. So we are going to remain diverse in our advertising, but we're going to put a lot more emphasis on digital marketing. Um, this year we upped that last year and we're going to continue to do that because we can get um, kind of that mobile tracking ID and so we're able to actually see conversions of when people come into the market and so that lets us know if our dollar is being spent well versus a print ad um, that we might not ever hear feedback on whether or not that really got somebody to come to the area. So um, just a couple of highlights, Mad Media, that's who we use to do our mobile ID tracking and then we're going to do that great co-op with Visit Mrs. Mississippi for Expedia. If y'all remember um, last time that I came to present um, information like this, that was the one that let us know how many room nights we actually got out of the campaign. Um, so we were excited that the state was allowing that co-op because it's it's pretty pricey. Um, and then we're going to do um, an NIL um, influencer campaign with Jerry and Ely. So we're excited to roll that out in the next um, week or so. And um, Sports Talk Mississippi and Super Talk, we're going to do a collaboration with that and um, work with M Trade Park. Um, the eighth page, if you don't notice those publications, um, it might be because they are a digital advertiser. So um, you'll recognize a lot of them, the print ads, of course, but you might not recognize all of those. And that's only because they're probably a digital format um, that's following you around on your phone um, that's in your pocket every day. But it's a robust media schedule. I'm really proud of it. And um, I think it'll serve us well all year. Um, digital content, that is just rocking and rolling along on page nine. Um, Hannah's really doing a great job with that, with the support of everyone else in our office. And small teaser, but we will have an exciting announcement um, on Friday from our office through digital, so y'all kind of watch for that. Um, and then in partnerships on page 10, um, we will kind of remain focused on all of those partners that really make everything happen um, here in town and doing our job to promote and support them. Um, I do want to draw your focus down to the partnership funding. So um, we still have that, that pot of money for funding and grants that we do every year. Um, this breakdown over here, the wheel, just kind of shows you how much emphasis was put on sporting last year. So 47% of our dollars were spent on ref rooms, um, room nights and hotels for referees or um, different 
receptions or things that these sporting events needed to come to town. And it's not just events that are happening at M-Trade Park. It's um, crappie tournaments or um, a lot of um, emphasis and relationship has been built with the Mississippi High School um, Activities Association. Um, they really want to not just bring football here and rotate it through the schools, but the other um, events as well. So our first test um, kind of for another sporting event will be tennis this coming year so we're really excited um, to have that so we'll remain um, focused on kind of better ROI on that and the sports seem to to give us um, a good return on our investment um, and then the last page is events that are sponsored um, from our office and um, I will not read all that to you you know most about it um, or most of all of it we are gonna obviously expand holly jolly holidays this year um, to have ice skating real ice this year um, for 12 days and we are going to do that at the armory um, but still have all the fun um, events on the weekends here on the square so we just needed we had such high demand, we just needed it to go a little longer. So um, if you have any questions after you look through it, um, you all know where I am. Thank you so much. We do, and thank you, Kenny, for working creatively over the past year to keep tourism going, and we appreciate all the hard work that you've done. All right, um, I at this time want to announce vacancies on the tree board. I mentioned um, Arbor Day a moment ago. We've got a tree board that is so diligent in helping us um, preserve trees in our community. And we have two vacancies on that board. If anyone is interested in serving, you can email cityhall at oxfordms.net to let us know. Um, we, I'm going to ask the board to approve an appointment to the Mayor's Council on Disabilities. I'm proposing that you all appoint Bruce Reynolds, uh, sent out to you his letter of interest um, maybe two weeks ago. So um, I would ask for a motion to approve Bruce Reynolds' appointment to the Mayor's Council on Disabilities. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Any Aye. opposed? Um, Janice Antonow served on this commission when, while she was an alderman, and um, as she is now at home, probably watching us online, probably not. She's probably so glad she's not here. But um, I have asked Alderman Preston Taylor to serve as the liaison to this commission, and he has agreed to do so. Thank you, Preston, for agreeing to do that. Um, now I'd like to request permission to accept a grant from the Bissell Pet Foundation in the amount of one thousand four hundred dollars for the benefit of the Oxford Animal Resource Center. It's not hard to get us to accept money. That's, that's right. So um, this is going to be something that happens quarterly. Um, if people are familiar with the name Bissell, they make vacuums. Uh, but the wife of the CEO is very, very, very interested in, into uh, shelter animal work. Um, so basically the way this grant works is we sign up. We did it for a week. Um, we'll do it for a week again in December. And for every dog that is adopted, we get $100 just for adopting out a dog. And we get $50 for every cat. Um, the most we can charge during that event for an adoption fee is $25. And how that resulted in that six day span was we got 10 dogs adopted and eight cats so we'll be awarded fourteen hundred dollars so for our first empty the shelters event i think we did pretty good i think you did i think that is great could i have a motion to accept that second. funding you already had a motion John. okay could i have a second i said it Okay, well, there you have it. Um, all in favor? Uh, Any opposed? Uh, thank you. And thank you, Nicole, for finding creative ways to fund our shelter. Rob Neely, request permission and authorize the general manager to sign a letter of intent with seven states power to pursue MDEQ and TVA grants associated with the EV fast charging station. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, so we've got an opportunity here to apply for multiple grants. Uh, TVA uh, has a grant available for 80% of the cost of a fast charging station um, for uh, the electric vehicles that are coming. And now MDEQ is offering um, a grant as well. And so we'd like to get a um, higher professional services uh, through seven states who we're a member of as Oxford Utilities uh, to assist us with these grants and help us choose a site and with the uh, implementation and deployment of the fast chargers. And so um, it could be up to $200,000 in grants by the right. time it's over with. And so we'd like to get permission to move forward with that. Wonderful. Thanks for pursuing that. Do sure. we have a motion? So moving. All right. A motion and a second. All in favor? Uh, Any opposed? Uh, Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Rob. 
All right, next on our agenda is an appeal of Planning Commission decision on case 2788 SPI, Oxford Commons LLC, Lloyd Wade, request for special exception for a recreational use, commercial indoor and outdoor districts allowed for property located at Ed Perry Boulevard being further identified as PPINs 4706 and 4707. Ben's gonna give us a brief update on, on where we are and then we will hear from um, the parties that are appealing this. Thank you, Mayor. Yep. At the uh, September 13th Planning Commission meeting, the Planning Commission granted a special exception to allow an indoor, outdoor recreational use that's commercial. Uh, the um, uh, This appeal comes from, uh, is being heard at the request of several residents that are uh, adjacent to this particular property. Um, the, um, the project proposes several multi-use outdoor uh, sports fields that will accommodate uh, baseball, softball, soccer, and other sporting activities. They also propose a 106,000 square foot building that will provide for indoor basketball or volleyball courts. Uh, they have a, uh, a planned building that would be a future phase of the development that would be approximately 25,000 square feet. There's a variety of other uses that would support this batting cages, maintenance buildings, et cetera. Um, this uh, particular use does, uh, does provide or require several standards. Um, because ball fields, according to the Land Development Code, do not require uh, or are exempted from the typical requirements related to lighting, there is a hard stop on when all lights have to be cut off, and that would be at 10 p.m. Uh, additionally, any indoor uses are required to be soundproof, so that way it minimizes or mitigates the, uh, the sound effect on the interior uh, of those particular buildings. Um, but again, this was a request from the, uh, from the Planning Commission uh, for the use. Uh, site plan, all of those elements were still be uh, required to be sought by the applicant uh, down the road. Um, the uh, adjacent property owners, um, and well, let me say that the, uh, the Planning Commission did approve this request with the three, three staff conditions, uh, which were, two of them were subject to the uh, requirements of the code. Lighting, uh, having to shut off at 10 p.m., soundproofing of the buildings, and then another requirement that uh, they had to seek site plan approval for uh, the basic concept as, uh, as it uh, was presented to the Planning Commission. The Planning Commission did vote five to two, uh, there were two dissenting votes, but, uh, but the motion carried to grant this use. The adjacent property owners did provide a, uh, a actually there were, there were two letters of appeal that were included in your packet uh, that seemed to mostly relate to uh, impacts related to lighting and sound and the quality of life associated with their, their neighborhoods. Um, and so I do know that uh, um, uh, Jennifer Samuels and Paxton Scott, as our other residents in here that uh, may uh, likely speak. Um, and I do want to point out that uh, I did provide y'all and, uh, and the neighbors with an updated lighting plan that was submitted to, to the city. Uh, there's a, um, I think it's synthesized in one graphic that shows the spillover light and they also included an inset that shows what was previously proposed from a lighting standpoint. They did have to make some, uh, some tweaks to that particular lighting plan uh, that minimized the effects and spill over onto the adjacent properties. Um, uh, otherwise, um, I'm happy to entertain any questions or I'll turn it over to the audience to speak. Well, we may have questions for you. Does anybody have a question for Ben before we hear from the people that are appealing this? Ben, let me ask you one question and, and that's um, as far as I understand under section 3A, I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but it, it says that outdoor recreational uses that use night lighting must close by 10 or must be located no less than 3,000 feet from fully residential areas and meet standards of section 5.4. Is that and section 5.4 just for those facilities that are located no less than 3,000 feet? Yeah, any other buildings, parking lot, uh, lighting, things like that? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Okay, any other questions for Ben? Then if Jennifer Samuels or Paxton Scott wants to come up to address the appeal, we invite you to come forward. Thank you, uh, sure. I'm Paxton Scott. I live at 414, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, Allen Cove. Um, 
And uh, we, we appreciate uh, the, the efforts that the applicant has made to adjust some of the lighting to minimize the impact, but I think we still have concerns that uh, while I know it's on a different level than an m type park, but you're essentially putting an m facility uh, directly, you know, within the city limits uh, on top of residential properties. Um, and so we just want to make sure that as many protections as can be placed uh, on, on the residential properties uh, are, are taken into account. Uh, you know, while the lighting adjustments do minimize some of the impact from the initial uh, assessment, uh, we still have concerns about the noise. Uh, if you look at their plans, they're calling for 628 parking spots. That's a lot of people. Uh, and I was out at M-Trade this weekend and th they've run out of parking spots. So, you know, th these, these types of facilities can easily outgrow their initial uh, capacity, uh, you know, with people parking on the, on the streets and, and whatnot. So, you know, as we think about, you know, 620 cars, I know that's, you know, uh, that's probably going to be very unique when you're going to have a full parking lot, but still, that's a lot of people yelling and screaming. Uh, and while these may not be fanatic fans because it's elite athletes, it's still, I mean, it's a lot of noise um, that's going to carry, and it's, it's only required to be 50 feet, uh, you know, a, a 50 feet barrier. That's not very far, um, you know, when you, when you look at it from, from your backyard. Um, so, you know, our, our request is that, you know, the, the city take into consideration, you know, one, is this the, the appropriate uh, location for a, a venue of this type? And two, um, that all consideration be taken to potentially change, and I know they've got to come back and, and request, uh, get approval for the site layout, but why can't the ball field to be moved to the street away from the residential properties and bring that soundproofed indoor facility back towards our properties um, at, at a minimum. Uh, that, that seems like, uh, you know, that, that is, you know, uh, when we were trying to protect the residential properties, that's, that's uh, the least we could, we could ask for. So uh, that's all I have, okay. unless there are questions Does anybody have for a question me. for Mr. Scott? Okay. No. Thank you very much. We appreciate you coming. And Jennifer Samuels. Hi, I'm Jennifer Samuels and I live at 31 County Road 2015. So it's on a different side of the proposed ball field. Mm -hmm. um, basically, I have the same concerns that Paxton has, and I appreciate the effort on the lighting, but I mean, part of me is still concerned that it's gonna be a glow <laughs> that just illuminates our area. And um, I also have concerns about the cutoff time. We spoke at the other meeting about what happens when there's a rain delay, or who's gonna monitor that it's actually cut off at 10 p.m. Um, and then also the noise, walkout music and things like that. From our house, which is at least half a mile from the high school, we can hear the band. So when we're talking about 50 feet in a different type of venue than a high school band playing at 3 p.m., um, there's just, it could be permanently detrimental to the neighborhoods surrounding this. And usually there's either a thousand foot or a 3,000 foot requirement but we're talking 50 feet. So I just want to make sure that everybody takes into account how it would affect the neighbors. Anybody have any questions for Jennifer? All right, thank okay. you very much. Is there anyone else that would like to speak regarding the appeal? Okay. Hi. I'm Sharon Andrews, and I too uh, am an adjacent property owner. And um, what I requested at the Planning Commission was that I, I'm not opposed to a sports facility, but if a special exception is granted, what I requested was that 
in addition to the 10 p.m. Uh, cutoff light time, that there also be uh, special conditions for the lighting and the noise. So perhaps a special condition could be that no amplified uh, sound system be used or that um, a certain type of lighting or, um, and I don't know all the technicalities, but that those uh, limits be in place so that the neighbors are not affected by the um, light or the noise trespass so that um, any special exception for this use contain those additional conditions. Okay, anybody have any questions for Sharon? All right, thank you. All right, um, is there anybody else that wants to speak on the appeal? Then I will ask Chip Wade and Casey, if you want to come up too, whoever, to speak on behalf of the park. <coughs> I appreciate y'all's time. Um, so I guess while while Casey's doing that to, to kind of address, um, so I, I understand their their concerns. You know, one of the one of the, so the noise question, the first one that, that we can address simply is the the type of facility that we're talking about. Um, no different than than M Trade. We have you know we'll have to have a, a sound system, but that sound system used for um, lightning alerts and things like that, right? So <clears throat> facilities similar to this, short of the indoor, the outdoors don't play music and have because there's multiple games going on on different fields that all have different timings. So the question about the amount of noise that's from an artificial standpoint versus traffic, um, we don't play that. So there's there's some code on. Um, the type of, of sound system needs to be used for warnings and alerts and things. But as far as music playing, it's not it's not a function of having music outside. Um, walk up music and things like that. If it is, it's parents that have a little boom box that comes up the, to the to the dugout or something. But it's not a, a you know a, a amplified sound point. As far as the indoor, again basketball, volleyball, all of that. Those building the building has to be soundproof based on the code. So. Um, you know, really the noise question is from a function of, of traffic, it's really no different than the traffic that's going to be um, moving along the frontage, frontage roads out there um, as well. So the real, the real big question is the lights. And if you think about the lights, um, I know Casey has some pictures up here. Can you show them? Um, so a, a little bit different than, than what we think about and oftentimes people think about the lights. So if you look at the bottom right, these are metal halide lights. Um, the, the big bright ones with the big glare and the glow, which is, are the lights that we grew up playing under. The lights in today's market aren't that. We actually had the Musco lighting um, company guys fly down this week and we did um, uh, two light examinations at Lafayette High School, which have a, um, a much higher end uh, metal halide light um, than we're using. So it's actually closer to the ones on the bottom. The ones that we're talking about are LED lights, the ones on the right. If you've been, I know we can't bring up Mississippi State, but if you've been to Mississippi State's baseball field or if you've been to Swayze, um, if all the lights around it are off, the lights at the stadium physically just shine at the, at the field. Um, really interesting here, Oxford High School, which has the same lights. So the lights that Oxford High School is using for their baseball field are the lights that we're putting on our field, and they're just on the backside of the neighborhood um, where the Oxford High School baseball field is. So the, the things we want to bring up here is, is there's really two types of light. There's the glow that Ms. Samuels talked about in terms of kind of the illumination. And then there's um, directional light, like if you look at a light bulb. And so Musco came out and we did this at um, Lafayette High School at, um, go back. So the, the lighting design here, if you think about the, the way that the lights are, and if you look at the, the bottom of the screen, down on the bottom right, the candela measure, the 0 .02 foot candle uh, max at the bottom is the glow, is, which is 0.2, um, which is 0 .02, sorry, um, is well below any of the, the recommended or um, um, lighting standards that's used in parks. Um, and then on the left, the candela, the 0 .986, is the brightness if you stare at a light bulb. So if you think about one as glow, one is as you stare at the light bulb. Um, a lot of the code and a lot of the properties 
um, are about 7,500 or what cities use as the, as the standard for those type of light systems. We're at 986. One of the things to, to mention too, so we actually went to the neighborhood and did the same light study in the front yard of 414, 412, and 410. The street lights are 4,700 candela, where in our property at the other side of the property and at 50 feet is only 986. So the brightness from the street lights in the front of the house are almost six times greater than what our light sources are at the property. The other thing to keep in mind um, is, and, and based on um, Ben's uh, approval before, we have to have a buffer. And part of that buffer and part of the environmental factor, the top left picture are behind the houses. And there's a set of 70 foot pine trees that will have a 50 foot buffer of pine trees with 70 feet high. Um, keep in mind, the fields are, are down, um, kind of a slope to go down. So to really see the lights like you see in this picture here, so the bottom right or the middle, which is really directional, you can see how dark it is on the outside and bright in the middle. You would have to look through the pine trees or over the pine trees from the house. So um, the glow in our facility is 0 .002 or 0 .02. The glow in the front yard of the roundabout of the houses is 0 .217. So the glow from the street lights are brighter than the glow if, if there were no trees and you were standing in the middle of our fields. Um, so, you know, I think that the big point to make here when we think about the measurements are one thing, um, that they're, they're far lower than um, most of the code. The other piece is the conception of the lights are very directional. You know, they're just like we put light bulbs in the house now, LED lights are very directional, kind of like can lights where you can point them. If you look at the top right of the screen, there's actually a shield on the lights. So one of the big questions, imagine putting um, a light bulb in a light and then putting a shade on top of it. In um, functional terms, there's a directional shade that is put on these lights to push them down. And so really the big, big points of the light is the, the looking straight at the light is about you know, it's, it's 10 times less than any of the, the codes that are out you typically used in cities. It's six times less than what's in the front yard of the, the um, uh, homeowners. And then the glow, which Ms. Samuel mentioned, um, the glow, we're 10 times less than the glow, even if you stood in the middle of our fields versus what is in the, in the driveway of the houses. So, um, you know, we, and we've got where um, that, that light um, migration doesn't overflow into their property now. We've, we've been able to, to readjust how the lights and the position of the poles to be able to, to direct that down without, um, without impacting the back of those houses. As far as Ms. Samuels and the, the other neighborhoods, they're not even in our glow map, so there's no overflow. Um, they're actually quite a bit away um, away from it. So, okay. Does anybody have any questions for Chip? Um, the first one, uh, Mr. Scott said, why can't the build, ball fields be moved and the building can be moved towards the residence? Can you address that? So in the back, of the, so the property is actually um, the, about the back third of the property. The grade is so much that, you know, it would, it's basically a, a 40 foot, 40 foot drop in the back of the property. So we couldn't put any building. That's there. We moved the fields as far up as we could. Um, you know, I think if we think about it from a, a functional standpoint, we have to have the building closer because of, of the topographic nature of the um, property. And, and knowing what I know in terms of the field structures, I'd much rather have the fields closer to us than the building because at any given time, while yes, we have 650 something spots, the way that the baseball and turf, the outdoor stuff works is there may be 40 people at the field at a time, right? These, these, this isn't where there's 500 people watching a baseball game at 22 playing. It's typically a player and their parent. Um, we were in Hoover this weekend and there were more players on the field than there were parents in the stands. Um, so from a, a density standpoint, there's far less density on the field with the fields there than the, the building, but the topographic nature of the land, we wouldn't be able to build in the back of it. And then, um the buffer, the 50 foot buffer, who owns that? We do. Would y'all be willing to put it in a preserve or a conservation? That's something we've done, that we've done previous at other developments. That way if we just know it's not gonna to be touched um, and, the, and kind of gives the neighbors a, a sense of security. 
But if they keep it, if they keep it right now in what they've got, they've got to keep that 50 foot buffer up and going. If you drop it into a reserve, they might not. It might drop into that reserve and if a tree dies, a tree dies. Right now, tree dies, they gotta replant that tree. They can't just come back in and plant a seedling either. They've got to keep that 50 foot buffer of trees up, if I remember correctly. So I'm not positive. And one of the things that Ben, they have to maintain a, uh, a buffer that provides 80 percent screen okay and, and keep on we we want the trees so right if you, if you think about what we don't want to have to do is build a 50 foot center field wall for guys to see if if i'm looking at a white wall or the back of a house versus um 70 foot high pine trees like we we have them for free rather than having to make an artificial backdrop okay. no amplified music i mean you, you're telling me you're not going to have anything except uh, your megaphones yeah. out there for emergency calls only. Same, same as they have it in trade. We have we have speakers that. Well, that, we say if there's a lightning delay or there's right. those yeah. kinds of emergency things. Emergency. Well, we don't announce players or yeah. right. whoever's yeah. at bat or no PA whatever. announcement. Yeah, we don't we don't yeah. have we don't have PA <laughs> announcements. And we don't <laughs> put it up to Pandora and play them while the guys are on the field. Uh, there will be in the in the building, but you keep in mind. When there's three baseball games going on in the seven on seven, they're all doing different things at different times. So the music's really, you know, an arbitrary question in terms of you know, we just don't distract all of them at the same time. And the sound, and the sound ordinance at the property line is still going to be in effect. True. Yeah. I mean, you know, where it butts up right to the property line. I mean, that's where the. Our new sound ordinance will be effect there. Right. How tall are the standards, the light standards themselves? The pole they go on. So they're different lanes, but the, um, they're 70 feet near nearest the property line. They're 80 feet as you get farther towards the center of the property. So we have a sort of problem. So there's 12 foot. So the berm, the trees are sitting on a berm that's about 12 feet above the field, and then the Houses are uh, four feet above the field, so and then the trees are uh, trees are we, so measuring a tree if it's seventy five feet, um, it's a special to measure. So we I think we got we're, we're anywhere from twelve to sixteen feet lower than what the tree line is uh, through there. Okay. Are there any other questions from the board? For Chip, for the residents that spoke. Okay. I'm a listener. Um, I live at 412 Allen Cove, and can you put can you put that light plate back up here for a second? The one that's got like the red and the green. Yeah. Okay. Can you show me where my house is? I'm 412 Allen Cove. Probably where that green dot is at the top. Mm -hmm. So you're saying that those lights are not. Really shot my house. And my house is right there. Right now, what this what this model doesn't show is the trees and the height of the the tree line versus these. Well, I know the trees are in my backyard. Right. I know how high they are. But what I mean, so that's that's what you're saying is this line is not going to shine. That's correct. They're direction. I just don't lines. see how that's possible. Well, they're go back to the if, if you'll if you'll drive if you drive around Oxford right now some of the things that I've noticed is like in my front yard we've got LED if the cities change some of their lights over to LEDs if you put a cone on those LED lights it literally is hitting the street we don't have any fall off light in our front yard anymore and it's good I mean you come by our house over on delay it's good to see that everything that I've seen I'm not an engineer but just looking at what they've got it's kind of like being in uh, the pavilion when you when you're sitting there watching the basketball court, it is so bright on the court. But you know when you're sitting up in the stands, you really don't have the light that you think you would have as reflection. I'm I'm, I'm not I'm not guaranteeing you that's what's going to happen because no, I'm just no, going no, by what I've been looking at. Know, because you know once it gets built, it's built. Right. And then it's hard to say. Well, you know, the speakers are supposed to cut off until the they don't. You know, that's not fair. So, so here's a good example. <clears throat> Question. Yes. She just said something. Once it's built, it's built. Can the lighting company, what's her name? Musk. 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 
can they adjust the lights? So if she has a problem or the Scots have a problem, we can come back and adjust to see if we can eliminate their, That's their correct. issue. That's correct. And, and what they do, so the, the question, um, <clears throat> previous lights were, think about them dumb lights like this. This is typically how most the old lights that we grew up with. And there was no directional component because LEDs weren't around. So, so this has a glow and that glow floats. Whereas the lights on here, these are LEDs. You can see outside of the, you know, literally eight feet outside the fence um, is there's very little light exposure. I mean, there's more lights on those cars than there are. If you think about this, your, and, and this is what um, the light demonstration showed, your visual interpretation of what the lights would be aren't the ones by your house. Because when you look at the back of them, they're actually pointed down and they're pointing here your visual representation of the far lights across the field. And so for you, you could look at them and see them, but they're not gonna glow, glow into the house. Those are gonna be based on the, the topography of the fields and based on the trees and based on where your house are, those are gonna be a good 18 feet lower than even your tree line. So you would have to go on the other side of the trees to even see the fields, the light. The, um... Oh, Miss Samuels had a, had a question. I cannot remember it now, so I'm sorry. I'm trying to remember. Sharon. And the other day, I know that when we were in, I actually went to their uh, presentation the other night at Lafayette. Sometime during that presentation, you had mentioned that if there was a, I'm not sure you said that if there was a problem, you could lower the lights, but at one point you mentioned that this light was 12 feet below the top of the pole. <coughs> it was used as some other type of light. I can't remember what that is, but I mean, we're able to- It's a ball know, light, the ball light. The ball light, okay. Yeah, yeah it's used to be that. Where they, where they used to spray light everywhere. Uh, they've directed them so far down now, they actually can't see the ball. When it goes in the arc of the flight of the ball, so you actually shot the light up a little bit so you can see that ball. So you okay, see, I got you. See the middle of those poles? Yeah. There's mm -hmm. lights on the bottom that shine up, but it's like shining a flashlight into the sky, per se, to, to light up the sky. Um, but it doesn't get above the, the poles. And so that's the, the reason they're 80 feet typically, you know, the, the ball's gonna get out of the out of the pole structure and come back in. Um, I, I remember now. Um, rain delays, um, how do you handle that? I mean, don't have them. No. But, so this is a programming issue, right? If, we have rain delays, and, and this isn't any different than really anywhere we play. Hooper, I was in the Hooper this weekend playing. Um, after, I think after 8.30, if it's still raining, we haven't started the game, they don't even start the game. Um, so part of that is because the next set of games, the next morning, they usually just, they program them in that way. Um, so we we start typically at 8 o'clock in the games, um, you know, or 8, 10, 30, 1, 30, 2, you know, the last game, usually if it starts, it starts at 7.30 or 8 o'clock and they're out in 40 minute games. Um, so um, it's just a programming issue at that point. And then the other thing, the other night, um, technicians said they can do, do the app on their phone where they turn the lights out, correct? So I would have, whoever's managing the facility at that point would have an app. So if you, the other night, um, Gary, he called Mexico and just said, hey, I need to turn off these lights on field four in Oxford, Mississippi, and the field, the lights cut off. So we have access, um, I mean, not that you want access to the app, but at 10 o'clock you hit a button, it goes off from a safety standpoint, but you can do it with your phone. And hey, you don't want me to have that access. <laughs> and, you, and you can monitor. Jason <laughs> wants that access. Look at him, he's smiling. He's going to hand his kid his phone to play a game, and all of a sudden you've well, got... The light usage and all of that's monitored now, where... Um, these are on and off, you know. Um, it's, just, it's just the level of sophistication of life is so much superior to life. Even, it, yeah, it's, it's a quite impressive. Well, listening to your lighting, I, I'll be honest, the, the lighting doesn't bother me, the, the noise does. It, it makes me a little nervous. Um, but I think that's going to be something that, with our noise ordinance that we've got right now. I mean, 10 o'clock, residential area, it kicks into ambient. So you can't be doing any work on the field after 10 o'clock, was it 10 o'clock in the residential area, the ambient. And these are all turf, there's no grass, there's no dirt. This is the, mm -hmm. part of the reason for that is just that, you know, the rain, rain delays, um, unlike they used to be on dirt where you had to stop for an hour and a half, you, can, you just wait for the rain to stop and you start to play. But as far as work, and there, there's far more work that goes on in in trade than we would have, have here. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, if you have a 
have a game, a cut, 10 o'clock cutoff time. You know what I mean? In order to get the players off the field and get all that sound out of there, you're going to have to shut down the game at 9.45. Um, I mean, is, is that what you're, you're saying you're going to do? I mean, it's, it's going to be game to game. I mean, if, if they tell us that it's got to be 10 o'clock, it's got to be 10 o'clock. So, I mean, if, they're, if those lights cut off and there's still lights in the parking lots and stuff, just like at Walmart, you know, yeah, they can get in and out. But if, I mean, if the rule is 10 o'clock, we have to abide by the rule of 10 o'clock, you know, the, and, and we program the games accordingly. So instead of starting at a, an 8 o'clock game, maybe it's a 7.30 game with a 15 minutes split, so it goes to 30 minutes split. And if, if, if it's part of our land development code zoning ordinance that this sort of special exception requires 10 o'clock, the lights are going to be off at 10 o'clock, but one of y'all is going to call the police and the lights are going to go off at 10 o'clock. I mean, I, to me, that, that's easy. It's a safety issue that if they still have players in the field at 10 and have to turn off their lights, all of a sudden they've got their own problems. So I, I mean, I, I think the 10 o'clock lights out and noise with it has to happen. And, and so we can, and the beauty of this is you can turn off all the top lights and leave the bottom lights on, where if you see those little lights that are on the bottom of the pole, they're usually about 12 or 14 feet off the ground. They're almost like little street lights where there's no, you know, it basically is kind of like a, a tree light in your yard. That, that's enough lighting to get people in and out of the park. Yeah, I mean, the only other comment I would make is that I, I, mean, I know that I've got a, a tree, good tree line, and I believe Jennifer does as well, but as I've observed for uh, our president at 410, uh, it, it, there's definitely some breaks in the tree line see straight across um, so you know I, I, would, uh, I just want to make sure that that voice gets heard as well it's, it's not a solid tree line all the way through it may be in my backyard it may be in Jennifer's but uh, 410 there's definitely some breaks in the tree line um, you know. well also the leaves fall off of the trees in the fall I mean nobody brought that up but when when the leaves I mean like I can see your house all winter um, but the other, the only other thing I wanted to bring up too is like nobody's talked about how often they're going to use this field. This is almost every day out of the year. So this is not like a high school stadium where there's seven football games and there's houses backing up to it and then it's finished. I mean, we're talking seven days a week, 340 something days a year. It's a lot. So I just want to make sure everybody recognizes the potential for this in this area. Thank you. Paxton, do you have anything else? No, okay. Thank you, Ben. If you'll come up. I just want to add one more thing. Um, to, uh, to the comment about the, uh, the lights that are at like street light level, that was, uh, that was exactly what uh, Alderman Hahnemann was pointing out at the beginning of the discussion in his question as to whether the rest of the site would be subject to the requirements of our lighting provisions within the code, which you're not allowed to have any spillover light. And, and, and so that's where our site plan review process will have to take that into consideration. We'll look at a photometric survey that will show all of those lights. So while they may turn, while they will be required to turn those off at 10 p.m., you know, if they have lights that are, you know, lighting the sidewalks that get people back to their, their car, that's fine. They would have parking lot lights, wouldn't they? Yes, absolutely. But those have to be contained per the code. Those Correct. have to be contained within the site. That's right. That's right. Yep. And then uh, one other item related to the buffer, uh, as part of that uh, site plan review process, we'll go in and we'll evaluate a landscaping plan that's going to provide for a variety of different um, landscaping elements because that's going to help achieve an 80% screen there. It's difficult with the elevations, but we'll try and complement the existing that's already there with evergreen, uh, things that will grow taller so that way when it is winter time and the leaves fall, there will at least be something that's going to continue to grow uh, somewhat vertical. So that's something that we'll look at in site plan review. Okay. Yeah. Any other comments, Sharon? I, I had a question as to whether um, I see in the planning code and municipal ordinances that ball fields and sports facilities are accepted from the light and the sound ordinances. Is that correct? And it, if it is, wouldn't it be more prudent to make those requirements applicable to this project as a special condition 
so that, you know, say this project doesn't go forward or it turns into new hands, that, that those conditions that they be um, uh, governed by the light and the noise ordinances go with the property no matter who's operating it. And I really do appreciate the work that they've done and the promises that they've made, but if it was special conditions running with the land, then we would all feel more comfortable um, in, in our neighborhoods. Yeah, I think, uh, as, as we discussed earlier, that the ball fields themselves are exempted from the lighting requirements, uh, but they have to be shut off at 10 p.m. All other elements related to lighting would be subject to the uh, lighting provisions within our code. Uh, as for a sound ordinance, I think if they're subject to the sound ordinance, it sounds like um, the PAs, based on what you've been told uh, tonight, the PA would be used specifically for um, emergency provisions and uh, weather alerts, things like that. Um, otherwise, anything that's out there would be subject to the, uh, the sound ordinance that we have. Okay. So Either. you're saying that we do not need a condition of what Ms. Andrews... If, if you would like to place a condition on it, you, you are... Uh, but that, it that's is governed. It's not... That's right. Yeah. But you can't <clears throat> still just... Well, I think we did, just to ease them, <clears throat> we put that condition as long as the use is, is of what the special exception, and I'd hate to tie the land where, if, you know, if something were to happen and this project doesn't go forward, we don't want to tie the land up to that provision. Does that make sense? Okay. Let's make, can we? We need to make a motion to do that, or well, what, what? it would it would take a motion to overturn the planning commission's ruling. Well, then, okay, it's being it, that's what's being appealed. It, if there is not a motion to overturn the planning commission's ruling, so when it comes to site plan, then that condition would need to be. That's when that when that's when that condition. And I do think, Mayor, that the board has the power to either um, overturn <coughs> or affirm with, with conditions. conditions they yeah. find appropriate. So if you add those conditions, you have that. You know, I think you have that. Sure. As long as you're looking at doing that, this amplified music, I, I just, what bothers me is what you just said a while ago is other people bring their own music. And I'm like, okay, somebody's going to bring their boombox out there. I can hear a car from here to the end of North Lamar sometimes, um, it, depending on what size boom box they're bringing. The when fact that y'all are still calling it a boom box, maybe. I know that. I'm back in my <laughs> Maybe it's the great, well, I did 30 years ago, but I'm not still talking about it. Um, okay, sorry. Just calling? the fact that we're Don't calling something a boom box but is anyway, just. Amplified music. <laughs> but well, if somebody's bringing <laughs> amplified music in. Well, if the, if the condition was that all requirements of the ordinance shall apply um, and be included in the site plan approval, if that's the condition you add, yeah. then, you know, if people bring whatever they bring, um, I like the way you're struggling to figure out what that is now, aren't you? If they the decibel level, uh, then, then they're breaking the law in the same that's way right. or any other business or in any other house in the city by. Or driving down the road or whatever, yeah. Right. Okay, so what is the board's desire? It would take a motion to overturn the Planning Commission's ruling um, or a motion to uh, affirm, affirm their conditions. ruling affirm with them. whatever conditions you'd like to list. I'd like to make a motion to affirm with the following conditions that, uh, I can't remember my condition now. <laughs> sound, ordinance. <laughs> sound ordinance and the light uh, pollution uh, stay within the criteria and that uh, it run with the land. Is that right? Run with this property. property. No. This no. Rail. Run with this property. Run with the use. With the special exception. This, with the special exception. All right. Is there a second to that motion or is there any other comment? I'll second it. All right. Any other comment? All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Thank you. All right, thank y'all. Um, number 14 is um, tabled. Number 15, request approval of a final plat amendment for case 2797LT2 LLC for the Grove at Grant Oaks Phase 5 for property located at 325 Fazio Drive, being further identified as PPIN 8949. Gray Parker. Thank you. 
this is a fairly minor plat amendment where the applicant is now proposing to remove a 0.13 tract of land from phase five, which is located in the northwest corner of this single family subdivision and is referred to as tract two. This small portion of land was originally intended for future road access, but is now planned to be included with a new lot and an additional phase of the subdivision. Attached with this case file are letters of approval from other owners in the subdivision that the applicant has deemed adversely affected or directly interested. And at the October Planning Commission uh, meeting, the commissioners unanimously recommended approval of the request with the two conditions stated in your report. All right, are there any questions from the board? Make a motion to approve. Second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Gray. Request approval of a final plat amendment for case 2798, Lucius and Catherine Sams, for the refuge of Oxford, lot seven and eight, for property located at 107 Refuge Hill Road, being further identified as PPIN 28619. Robert? Yes, uh, so the applicant is looking to amend the plat to reflect a change to the property line between lots seven and eight. A portion of the northeast property line was moved approximately 10 feet to the southwest to accommodate the existing house within the setback requirements. Um, at the October 11th uh, Planning Commission meeting, the Planning Commission unanimously uh, recommended approval of the request uh, for final plat amendment approval for the refuge of of Oxford lots seven and eight with the conditions that are listed in the staff report and staff recommends approval of the amended final plat uh, with the three conditions that are listed in the memo. Move we approve. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Chief McCutcheon is coming to request permission to accept a donation of Narcan from Mississippi Care. Yes ma'am. Uh, they came by the other day and uh, had some samples for us and wanted to drop some off, so we said, wait till we get approval. And had some is, samples for you? They did. <laughs> right. They did. We well, I hope that we don't need to those samples, test. but uh, I sure am yeah. glad that we have Narcan available yep. and unfortunately have to use it more times than we'd like for <laughs> folks who have Sorry. overdosed. Second. So we will take those. All in favor? No. Uh, Any opposed? All right, request permission to accept a donation of candy from Kroger for community Halloween events. So Narcan, candy. candy. <laughs> Some of those samples disappeared, by the way. All right, all in favor? Uh, Any opposed? Thank you. First reading of proposed ordinance amending Chapter 102, Article 20, Section 638B and 657, and event permits. Mayor, this is something we actually addressed during the summer, but we didn't do a good job of following up with you guys. Uh, when we met with our county and university officials, we wanted to mirror the same permitting process. And uh, one thing that we wanted to reduce was the 30-day requirement to a 14-day requirement. We just didn't follow through with the second and third reading, so we want to amend uh, that. But also throughout this year, we've created the sound ordinance and we need to add that language in there. So those are the only two changes. All right, so this is a first reading, so we'll have a second reading and public uh, comment at our next board meeting. Request permission to approve a parade assembly permit for the North Central Mississippi Board of Realtors to host the annual Christmas parade on Monday, December 6, 2021. If it rains that date, they'll have it on Tuesday, December the 7th, and um, the setup will be from 3 until 8. I think the yes, parade actually starts at 7, if I'm motion not mistaken. But 630. 6.30, okay. All right. Motion to approve in a second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? All right. Request permission to allow code enforcement to cut the grass at six. Do what? Oh. Um, request permission to allow code enforcement to cut the grass at 627 Piedmont at a cost of $200 and authorize the city clerk to add the cost of the 2021 tax roll for said property. Motion made to approve. Second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Request permission for uniformed officers to work details at Walmart for Black Friday on November 24th through the 25th from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. December 24th and 25th from 4 p.m. to 10 p.m. at a rate of $35 per hour. Second. Like we've been doing. Yes, yes, sir. Second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Request permission to approve a list of budget reallocations and amendments from FY 2020-2021. Yes, um, we are getting to the end of fiscal year 2021. The books do stay open through the end of October, so you'll see our list has gone from approximately 14 pages to three pages. Very minimal. So, again, housekeeping. Second. Some of 
All in favor? Wait, hold on. I'll take it. Uh, uh, I thought you said all. I did both of them. He's first. <laughs> we are, the wheels are falling off up here, people. Okay, we have a motion. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Uh, Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Thank Request you. Request permission to advertise for bids for the municipal depository for years 2022 through 2025. Yes. Uh, in the past, this has been for a two-year uh, period of time. The legislature, however, did change that law. So it's now a four-year period. That's the span there. We are asking to advertise for bids. So moved. Second. All in favor? Uh, Any opposed? Authorize the city clerk to request the annual disbursement from Oxford Reserve and Trust Fund through so Glenn Mead. Moved. Yes, Second. that's our annual disbursement. I believe it's going to be over a million dollars this yes. year. Boom. All in favor? Uh, Any opposed? Uh, thank you. All right. Consider a change order for additional contract time for the conference center roof project. The never-ending conference center roof project. Never-ending. Um, but soon to be started. The <laughs> contractor has well, requested- that's Moving in the right direction. Right? He has requested 60 days of contract time due to delays. He provided documentation where he ordered materials in sure. July and they are just we arriving. Motion yep. made to approve. Sorry. Second. All in favor? Uh, Any opposed? Uh, uh, consider a contract with Precision Engineering for professional services for the design of a connector road from Piggy's Road to Commonwealth Boulevard. Yes, we'd like to hire Precision Engineering to get the design of this road started. It's been discussed for a number of years and we're ready to get started. Motion made. Second. All in favor? Uh, uh, any opposed? Uh, All right. Um, number 28 has been delayed. Um, you have before you at your spot, and you'll see it's highlighted as well, a memorandum of understanding that was sent to us by the Mississippi Department of Transportation Commission concerning the intersection of Mississippi State Route 7 and University Avenue. Um, you want to start and you okay. take over. Okay. So a few months ago, we brought this MOA before you. You uh, directed us, we, we, went, we went through the MOA, we reviewed it, you made comments, directed us to modify the MOA and send it back to MDOT for, for their approval. We sent it back to MDOT and it came back with it. In this version, as you see in front of you, was still some issues for us to address. So I will point out to you and you will see highlighted on your copy some of the major issues um, that I wanted to get your feedback before I return to um, to give them a final word from you all. You will see that um, the last whereas on page one says that the city will contribute funds of $1,750,000. Um, the city has previously agreed to contribute $1,000,000. 750000 of those dollars was given to us by the legislature in the bond bill, uh, no, appropriations bill uh, a couple of years ago. Another 250000 was given to us in another appropriations bill this past session by the Senate Transportation Committee. On page two, um, you will do, see do that- Do we want to take these one at a time and, and discuss this or- We can, sure. Uh, I mean, I let her go through them and then okay. you can decide. I don't, I, we can do it however you prefer. Um, the, um, you will see next, um, it says that the county would contribute funds of a million dollars, which would be up to them. Um, the commission is willing to contribute up to $1 million. Well, how generous of them on their own road. Um, and we have had previous conversations with our transportation commissioner, John Caldwell, who has stated to us that he believed that the Mississippi Department of Transportation should meet the monies that have been secured by the city of Oxford, which would be $4 million, not in fact up to a $1 million on the road they own. Um, whereas the parties, being the city, the county, and the Mississippi Department of Transportation, are willing to equally divide the responsibility for project costs that exceed $7,750,000. We're not. No. Um, number one, the first bid, or the first estimate that was discussed by the previous um, executive director of the Department of Transportation, she stated that she believed this job would be around $9 million. That was three years ago. We know that construction costs have gone up about 20% every year. I don't think there's any way to think it would be reasonable for this job to come in at 7.75, and there's really no way in the world that the taxpayers of Oxford can have just an open check, you know, for whatever the overages are to split those <coughs> three ways. No, thank you. You will see that um, they also go on to say Probably one, well, they say that the city will be responsible for any errors and omissions and omissions of the plan design. Why would the city be responsible for any errors and omissions of a plan design that MDOT will sign off on and give to us to build? 
Um, they also say that the right of way will be acquired in the name of the city. Why would the city acquire property in the name of the city to be donated or to be utilized by the Department of Transportation on a roadway that they own? Then they say that upon completion of the construction, the city will properly maintain University Avenue East and West of the interchange. Um, and the city cannot continue every project that we have done with MDOT over the past six years at least, they have included this that would say that the city should, at the point of constru after construction, maintain what is owned by the Department of Transportation Commission. The city of Oxford cannot take over the responsibilities that the Mississippi Department of Transportation is abdicating to others. They need to take care of their own roadways. We have generously used taxpayer money, our time, and our political collateral to bring in $5 million for an MDOT project, and they are saying that they will be donating up to a million dollars. City can't do that. Um, and the Department of Transportation should not ask. They should take care of their roadways. In case you can't tell, I'm a little passionate about it. And um, I would ask this board to consider, and as conversations come up, um, the Department of Transportation often likes to say that, um, that the city should have, quote, skin in the game. Well, over, um, we've had skin in the game for a really long time, but a few examples of that over the past few years, City of Oxford taxpayers are paying back a developer $11 million for the MDOT roadway, Highway 7 and Sisk Avenue interchange. The MDOT frontage road project that they proposed years back, the city went to the expense of $751,992.77 for utility relocation, and then MDOT didn't build the road. Um, an MDOT safety project at County Road 401, the city's expense for utility relocation was $465,838.70 for a project we did not ask for, nor did we want. Highway 7, the city at the end of 2022 for Highway 7 will have spent $6,178,000 to relocate utilities for a Highway 7 widening that still hasn't made it on the 25 year list. So I would say that the city of Oxford very much has skin in the game. The city of Oxford brings to the table $5 million to build this intersection at University Avenue and Highway 7. I would ask the board to allow me to negotiate with MDOT um, regarding all of the different things that we've just mentioned that, um, you know, that we can talk to them about taking, a, taking out of this memorandum of, of agreement. I'm sorry for MDOT, so moved. Second. <laughs> Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Get your game face on, MDOT. Okay. <laughs> um, consider a resolution of intent for tax increment financing in conjunction with the Colonnade Crossing. Clark. All right. This is the first step in the process to issue TIFs to, for Colonnade Crossing on Highway 30 or Molly Bar Road. Uh, what you, if, if you move forward tonight, all you're doing is sitting the notice and setting the date for the public hearing, which will be at the next board meeting for the TIF plan. Now, there's a long, there's a long ways to go. Of course, that's once once you have the public hearing at the next meeting and adopt the TIF plan, then we then then we'll have to work on another MOU or MOA with MDOT. We'll have the interlocal with the county, and we'll have the development agreement that would all all come forward before you before the the deal would be consummated. So, I just wanted to, if you want to move forward, this is our first step. So. All right. Questions from the board regarding the um, TIF plan, the TIF intent? This is what, step one of 10? Step one of, yeah, 14. Uh, hadn't counted them, but about five. But the TIF money is just used exclusively for the, the, in, in this particular project, the request is that the TIF money is used exclusively for uh, improvements on the right-of-way, some being our right-of-way, some being MDOT right-of-way. It's a series yeah. of roundabouts along <laughs> Highway 30. Fixing more MDOT, thank you. Uh, you're welcome. Mm -hmm. But I'll make that motion. I'll second. All right. Any questions or comments from the board? All right. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. I'll ask the board at this point to consider an executive session. Move and consider executive session. Second. second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? The board will now consider an executive session. 